What is going on you guys and welcome back to another video. If you are new to the channel here, my name is Brandon, filming another video from home, but today I got two stocks to buy going in the upcoming week. Both of these do happen to be international companies, so they're actually based outside of Canada, outside of the US, but I do think for the reasons that we talk about today, they do look quite promising. I will just remind you guys that as always, we do have our investing academy as that first link down in the description below. If you're looking for courses and training, whether you're beginner, intermediate, we even have a retirement planning program. We work with people all across the country, teaching them step by step how to invest in the stock market. But today we are going to start things off with the company Taiwan Semiconductor. This is the largest dedicated semiconductor manufacturer on the planet. They're obviously based out of, you guessed it, Taiwan. Today, the market cap of this company is sitting around 600 billion. This is one of the largest companies in the world, yet I still believe there is a lot of room to grow. Just keep in mind, although this company is based over in Taiwan, they do absolutely trade here on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker TSM. Shares have started to kind of come down. Uh, we're down about 15% off highs, 14% rather. We're looking at a PE today of 29.22, and they do pay a nice little dividend. But when we talk about semiconductor stocks, we often think to the ones here in North America. The NVIDIAs, the Intels, the Qualcomms. Well, there are very large and powerful and successful companies outside of Canada. This company actually generates a ton of its revenue from the smartphone divisions. I mean, to be honest, guys, there are semiconductor chips in almost everything out there. Everything we do has some form of chip involved, which is why this space has been so powerful and as rewarding as it has. Taiwan Semiconductor in particular drives about, like I said, 50%, 44% in the smartphone space. High performance computing is another very big area for them, representing about 30 to 40% of revenues. They do have exposure to automotive, digital consumer electrics internet of things and a variety of others but without a doubt the smartphone area and the high performance computing do make up the largest portion of this business now i want to go over some of the metrics and just show you why this company is as exciting as it is to me this is actually the first time i've talked about them on the channel but i've been watching them for quite some time pretty much across all major metrics we are seeing some very, very positive growth. Do keep in mind that these are in Taiwan dollars, so this is not USD. Nevertheless, we still get a very, very clear picture in terms of how well this company is growing. I just look back over the past eight to 10 years or so just to get an idea, and this company has effectively nearly tripled their revenue. So again, in Taiwan dollars, yes, but this is the equivalent, just FYI, of over $50 billion USD. Doing so with strong margins, both on the gross and the operating level, What's important to me, other than seeing this top line growth and seeing that the company is able to grow and sell, I want to see how well this is hitting the bottom line, where this is going to impact us as investors, whether they're able to pay out dividends, whether this is going to be retained, and we're going to be having more and more growth in the share price. Well, absolutely, whether we're looking here at net earnings or net income, rather, whether we're looking at an earnings per share basis, to me, one of the metrics I very much like to look for is free cash flow. And across all metrics, this company is firing across all cylinders, just to put it quite simply, very, very, very strong and healthy company. Now, if you're somebody that's not entirely up to speed with TSM, this company has a stellar balance sheet to go along with the strong earnings. I'm actually just going to toggle these off. This is just some of the sites that I would be using in the back end. But if I toggle over here to balance sheet, one of the things that I really want to share with you guys, uh, just take a look at their cash, the assets that they have on hand, short term investments. We see this number basically in the previous quarter up to 43 billion. I'm actually just going to overlay that here with their long term debt just to get a picture of what is going on within the company. No question that this company is a is in a very, very strong financial position. One of the ratios that I would actually throw over here is either a quick ratio or a current ratio just to kind of see the short term liquidity needs and how well a company is doing. If we threw up a current ratio, looking back over the past time year, past five years, sorry, ample cash coverage. We see that up at about a 2.3, 2.4. This is something that we love to see, just making sure that the company is healthy, being able to meet their short-term obligations. And when we see that type of growth in the numbers, in the revenue, in the earnings, to me, it's checking off all the boxes here, at least at a first glance. In the previous quarter or the recent quarter that they actually just posted a couple weeks back, sorry, a month or so back, January uh, January 13th, 2022, they absolutely crushed their earnings. They pulled in 1.15 $1.15 per share, which was up 19% over the previous quarter. This did beat analyst expectations at $1.12. 
overall revenue or company sales we could look at up 24% to 15.74 billion. This is of course US dollars now that we're jumping back to, but overall they had a great report. I think this company is firing on all cylinders. And if I were to just look at a price target, which is one metric that we can use, whether we're looking at an analyst consensus, here we see about a 20% upside, 21% upside from where we stand today. Morningstar uh, believes the stock is trading at a 32% discount. Again, you gotta take these with a grain of salt, but nevertheless, this company, now that it has started to fall, I think is looking attractive if you are looking for a growth company. Yes, they are based over in Taiwan and that's obviously the hub, but that is by no means the end of where this company is going. They're actually investing very heavily. They're building a huge plant over here in Phoenix, which was announced sometime last year. This plant is expected to be huge in the American market, really just expanding their operations globally. They've invested up to $44 billion or to invest up to $44 billion to beef up their chip production. One thing that is worth considering, and of course, there are a lot of risks when we invest in international companies. Absolutely. When we're looking at China, Taiwan, whatever you want to define it as, there are the risks there. And one of the ongoing political issues, one of the ongoing risks, I should say, rather, with Taiwan is the, the tension that they have with China and whether China is going to invade and take over. Tough to say what the future has in store for the situation from what I've been reading, from what I'm hearing over here in Canada. I do believe that the allies in US in particular would really strongly back this if this were to be the case. Obviously, if things do escalate, that would have an impact on the business, but the numbers in and of themselves are, in my opinion, they speak for themselves. I don't think there's really much of an argument to be made as to whether the semiconductor or the chip space of this market is an important one to be in, whether you're doing it through a Qualcomm or an NVIDIA or Intel, whatever the case is. I think it's very fair to have some exposure to this space. Pretty much everything that we do, again, in our daily lives, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's our computers, our smartphones, data centers, you name it, chips are an integral part of this. And I believe that is going to be the case going forward, presenting a very good opportunity going forward. And with the shares down, again, trading at a very fair PE of 30, I think forward earnings, I believe are somewhere along the lines of 23, 24. I think that's very, very exciting. Again, it's more or less an opportunity to buy this stock at a range where they have been trading at over the past year, getting a little bit of a discount if we want to look at it that way. Again, analysts are projecting that this stock is undervalued based on their growth projections, but Taiwan Semiconductor is the first stock to consider if it fits your risk profile, if you're looking for that international exposure, and if you're looking for a high class growth company that is situated over in China. Now, before we move on to our next stock, if you haven't heard of the platform Inverse before, I'm very excited to announce a new partnership on the channel. This is one of the platforms that I've been using for a while, and now they've officially become a partner, one of our sponsors, and I thank you to them for sponsoring today's video. There is a link down in the description below. If you do want to go sign up for their wait list and get in on the platform, you'll actually notice that this was Inverse that I was using, they're a Canadian based company, but they have basically all North American equities and you have some very, very powerful charting tools, tools that would go into your research. I love the way that you can essentially pinpoint different metrics and essentially generate up a chart based on whatever it is that you're looking for. It is very, very powerful. Again, I've been using it for quite some time and I'm actually gonna show you in this upcoming segment, a very valuable way to use it when looking at dividends. Again, that is linked down below check them out. But the next stock that we're talking about today is a very different type of play. Definitely not our growth type of company. This is what I would consider a value play. If you're looking internationally, it's the company Imperial Brands or Imperial Tobacco Group. This is an ADR that does trade over the counter. So depending on your brokerage, you should be able to buy it. Just basically take a look at that. The ticker that you'd be looking at is IMBBY. And if you caught the last video that we did, when we did a portfolio review, I was going over while simple. One of our top performers was British American Tobacco, a company that had been slammed, trading in an oversold and an out of favor territory. I was absolutely loving the value at the time. We're pulling in a very, very nice dividend. Now this stock has shot up. We're up about 20% since then. Another great example that I've been watching is Altria or ticker MO. Again, these are all comparables in the tobacco space. And if you went back a year or two ago when I was producing videos on this, everyone said, oh my God, these are dying industries. No fun to buy. They're sucking. Well, it's when we buy into opportune times like this that we are rewarded as investors. Again, not to mention that you are pulling in a really nice dividend. With Imperial Brands, they haven't quite seen the recovery that the others have. Yes, they have bounced off a bottom, but I still do believe this stock is trading at an attractive valuation, especially if you care for dividend investors. Uh, dividends, sorry, as an investor. If you're not familiar with Imperial Brands, they are the fourth largest international tobacco company and producer out there. They're not 
as a parent here in Canada and the US, they do absolutely operate here under brands like Winston, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, for those that do smoke cigarettes, Cool, uh, Backwoods, just to name a few. It's not just cigarettes that they produce, but cigars, snuffs, even their newer segments, which they categorize here as NGPs. As with most companies, they are expanding, but 70% of this company's profits or their adjusted operating profits do reside in uh, over national, international markets, in particular, UK, Germany, Spain, Australia. So again, although this company may not be top of mind, if you do have family, if you do know people that are living outside of the US, very likely chance that they are using some of these products. Now, like I said, this is a company that is nowhere close to the same situation as uh, Taiwan Semiconductor. If we take a look at these revenues, they're not tripling over the past decade. They have essentially stagnated. Over the past few years, looking back to about 2016, 2017, the company's revenue has kind of capped out around this $30 billion range. Yes, they have ticked up to about 32. We are looking at British pounds here, just FYI. Nevertheless, let's understand this company is not growing. Now that does not mean that it doesn't mean there's not opportunity here. It's just that we would absolutely not classify it as a growth stock. It'd be a very different type of company. We look at very different types of metrics. For me, when I look at Imperial Brands, understanding that this is a dividend play with room for recovery, some of the key metrics that I look for is obviously in terms of dividends. What are they paying out in dividends? I want to see if they have ample coverage based on their earnings or earnings per share. Actually, one of the things that I'm going to compare up in this video is their free cash flow. And although the business isn't growing, free cash flow generation does remain rather strong. And actually, what I'm going to do here is just toggle over to this page, which is called, uh, which is basically a dividends tab. What we notice is that in 2020, they did actually cut the dividend. So $1.99 per share, 216, 241, 259, growing steadily. And then in 2020, they did cut that by a third. Here's actually a report just saying that one of the big priorities with this company is re uh, re repaying their debt. We're actually going to talk about that in just a moment. Nevertheless, dividend did get cut. However, we still are pulling in a very nice yield. Today, the dividend does sit at $1.88, which again is still a yield up in that 7 to 8% range. So although not as juicy, still very, very juicy, even after the 33% reduction. One thing that I think is notable here is the payout ratio. And I actually got a question from somebody. I forget where they asked me, but when we were talking about this company, they said, well, payout ratio is quite high. And absolutely, it is quite high. It has come down as their earnings have actually been juiced up. But in general, they're paying out more of their dividends, more of their earnings in dividends. And I'm going to toggle back to inverse here. I'm just going to re-log in. Give me a second. But um, yeah, one of the ways that I very much like to look at this is if I go ahead and punch in Imperial Brands here. Again, we are looking at the ticker IMBBY. It's the ADR. If I go over to the financials tab, what I will show you here is I'm just going to toggle these off. Let's toggle over to the cash flow statement, take a look at some of the dividends paid out. I'm just going to be going here to the cash dividends. I can toggle that in and as you see, uh, populates very nicely up in our graph. I want to compare that up to actually both earnings. Let's take a look at net earnings uh, available to common shareholders. More importantly, as I mentioned, I do want to toggle this up with free cash flow because again, if we just look at this right now, absolutely. They, in many years, are struggling to generate the earnings to pay out these dividends. Now, keep in mind, earnings, I think, is, is a great tool to use. And the payout ratio, I think, is very fair in many cases. But all companies have their own tax rates. They all have uniquenesses that are going on with the company. Interest charges paid that would, in fact, impact the earnings number. To me, a more reliable number with a business like this is to actually go down and add free cash flow into the mix. Now, when comparing it up, to free cash flow, what we see in green is that they're paying out about $2 billion in earnings. Again, we did see a drop off here in 2020, but they have in all years ample free co free cash flow coverage to pay these dividends. So typically when I see a stock that's paying a dividend of, you know, above 5%, let's say 5, 6%, you know, a slight red flag comes up. Not that it's always bad, but it's just one of my rules of thumb where I say we have to look into it deeper, right? We have to make sure that there's safety here within this dividend. If we strictly look at a payout ratio and said, oh, geez, well, it's too high for me. I think that may, in a sense, be a rookie mistake, because as we can see here, the company does have the cash flow to cover these dividends. Again, it's just a nuance. It's just a way of looking at it. But in my opinion, this dividend is actually rather safe. And they're doing this to kind of get the company back on track. Why they slash the dividend as well as making a sale of their premium cigar business. So this company used to have the brand Monte Cristo under the belt and geez, I kind of wish they still did. Uh, if I were to be going out and investing in the stock, which is a stock I don't own just FYI, 
we do own British American tobacco, but part of the dividend cut, part of the sale is in efforts to repay debt to kind of get the company back on track because they have more or less lost focus. To be completely honest with you, they even actually brought in a new CEO to kind of rejig things. So this is as of February, 2020, brought in CEO Stefan Baumhard, basically looking to just kind of shift things up. They are putting a very big emphasis on e-cigarettes, which obviously in this space has been a proven model that has been working with some other companies. Just in general, guys, I think with a stock like Imperial Brands, it's not a company that I would want to hold forever as a true, you know, long-term hold, but I do see some shorter term value opportunities as well as being able to collect those dividends. The stock has, in my opinion, maybe I'll go over here just so it looks a little bit easier, more of what you guys are used to. I think the stock has hopefully seen a bit of a bottom here. Again, looking at some of the other companies, their peers, their comparables, we're seeing a very similar trend. And I think this company still has room to follow suit. Today, the price to earnings multiple of this stock is sub six below six in the single digits this is what happens when you get an underloved company a stock that has underperformed for various reasons and in many cases some good reasons but when you're able to buy into opportunities like this well absolutely this is where we get rewarded as shareholders just taking a look at this if you were to bounce off lows you're up 40 percent non-inclusive of dividends again i think we should be giving the new CEO, the new uh, executive team, at least a chance to see if they can get this company back on track. In general, I think the dividend is safe for the meantime. Again, we will have to reassess and inflation numbers may absolutely take a toll on the company's profitability and their uh, ability to generate cash. We will have to see. But nevertheless, I still think that at these levels, trading at $24 for share, it is still a fair consideration. And again, these are both international companies, but I hope I've been able to give you guys two really fun examples. One growth stock, one value stock for more of the boring investor. If you are looking to just get a little bit of exposure, stocks that I think in the current day going into this next upcoming week could be some ones to look into. But that's it for the video today, guys. If you enjoyed, please do take a moment and drop a thumbs up. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. I haven't got the chance to get into the office just because of life and everything and the baby. I actually was curious, do you guys prefer these types of videos where it's just me, you know, kind of getting the content out, uh, maybe going over a little more of the, it's a little more messy, I would, I can say that for sure, rather than me kind of summarizing things and making it all nice. But nevertheless, I can absolutely pump these content out for you if you guys are liking the stocks to buy. If you are, drop a thumbs up. Let me know in the comment section down below. As I mentioned, we do have our investing academy. So if you are looking for courses and training, we work with everybody from complete beginners who have never invested before to people that want to get more in depth in the research. We have our mastery course or our intermediate or advanced course here. And again, we do have a retirement planning course. For those of you that are on the brink of retirement, we work with people all across the country. It's such a fun, cool environment. You can check this all out down in the description below. As I mentioned, you should absolutely try signing up for Inverse because it's completely free to use. Very excited to have them as a new partner on the channel. That will also be linked down below as well. And it's just a darn awesome research platform to be flat out honest with you for completely free. The tools that it has, the evolutions that I see coming with this and speaking with the uh, developers and the founders of this, this company here, I'm very excited and very excited to be working with them. But that will wrap it up for the video today, guys. If you are not already subscribed, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. And as always, I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.